Welcome back to the Hot 719 News. From 2018 to 2019, on to 2019 to 2020, Prime Minister Alan Chastney is defending his budget estimates and says the figures prove there is a turnaround. Solange Alfred reports. The debate on the estimate of revenue and expenditure for the 2019-2020 budget is underway. However, the first order of business was a breakdown by Prime Minister Alan Shastny of last year's 2018-2019 budget of approximately $1.4 billion. Prime Minister Shastny, who in the past has lamented the critical fiscal position that the current administration inherited back in 2016, says that a complete turnaround was achieved, with revenue growing faster than expenditure. Part of the debt strategy to mitigate risk in the debt portfolio was the establishment of the infamous sinking fund. To date, it has accumulated $21 million. As it relates to transfers, the projected outturn indicates that spending on, the, on this category will record an increase of $11.71 million relative to the approved estimates of $180.15 million for the current year. The projected outturn is primarily influenced by the increased support provided to the number of statutory corporations, for example, the St. Lucia Fish Marketing Corporation, the St. Lucia Marketing Board, the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, the St. Jude Hospital, and Castries City Council. Medical assistance increased significantly from an approved budget of approximately $800,000 to well over $5 million. Prime Minister Shastny defends the level of expenditure estimated for 2019-2020. He notes that the budget proposed for the fiscal year has a wider deficit than that of last year's, but he says that the expenditure is absolutely necessary. In order to fund these expenditures in 2019 and 2020, budget forecast a modest, modest increase of $43.93 million in total revenues and grants over the preliminary outturn for 2018 and 2019. Total resources for the year is projected at $1.248 billion, comprising domestic resources, current and capital revenue of $1.196 billion, and external grants of $49.07 million. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister notes that with the promise of major capital projects on their way, the 2019-2020 budget will adequately cater to not only the business community, but also the public at large. Based on the projected levels of domestic revenue, external grants and the targeted level of borrowing for the fiscal year for 2019-2020 budget proposals proposes an additional $104 million or a 7% increase in expenditure over last year's approved budget to reach a total of $1,591,589,000. Of this amount, recurrent expenditure is estimated at $1,344,871,500, and a capital expenditure at $246,717,500. At this proposed level, the budget targets a primary deficit of 0.1% of GDP and an overall deficit of 3.5% of GDP. The appropriation bill, which allows for the members of parliament to debate the proposed budget, will take place sometime the week of April 15th to 18th, 2019. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I am Solej Alfred. At least two religious leaders, Catholic and Anglican, have bemoaned a lack of reverence for the commemoration of Lent. The season of Lent, spanning 40 days and 40 nights, is one of fasting and praying for Christians in preparation for Easter. It allows Christians to enter into a spiritual frame of mind to commemorate Easter, known as the holiest time on the Christian calendar. St. Lucia is often described as a Christian society, predominantly Catholic, so do we still respect Lent, or have we strayed as suggested by the religious leaders? Here is what you had to say. 
learned when I raise people used to respect this season and now it's things different I guess because they have a different perspective about it I guess because they read the Bible and they know more about it so they don't celebrate it like they used to before that's how I see it <laughs> I don't think we follow it. We don't follow it. No. Well, no, presently I don't feel like Lucians respect anything to do with God. It's like we're, we're gravitating towards the negativity of society. You just get, and now we're forgetting our Lent, our Easter, our different um, religious um, holidays. You check it and, we, and it's not just about the holiday, but it's about what you do. You understand? It's about like what you do. If the holidays say no meat for whatever, oh, you know, you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, so no, what, what I feel is like, no, we don't, we don't pay no attention to Jesus Christ and the Bible and our laws and rules we're supposed to be following. That is, that, that, that is, I don't know why it's so, but we tend to gravitate towards the negative. Time for us to gravitate towards the positive. Kiss a killing. Man, by men shall kiss a killing. Kawem. We. What I should not ban Kawem. There's so many things. There's so many reasons, you know. The, the, the young people are all confused now, you know. There are so many things distracting them. Those were your views. The division among CARICOM countries on the Venezuelan issue within the Organization of American States, OAS, continued Tuesday as the Permanent Council of the Hemispheric Body voted to accept the nomination of a candidate supported by opposition leader Juan Guaido, who is seeking to replace President Nicolas Maduro as head of state in the South American country. St. Lucia, Jamaica, Haiti, and the Bahamas voted in favor of accepting Gustavo Ta as the National Assembly's designated permanent representative pending new elections and the appointment of a democratically elected government in Venezuela. But Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica, Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Suriname joined Venezuela in voting against the measure. While Barbados, Guyana, St. Kitts and Nevis and Trinidad and Tobago abstained. Belize was the only CARICOM country absent when the vote was taken on Tuesday. The OAS Permanent Council is chaired by the U.S., which is at the forefront of efforts to remove Maduro, who was sworn into office for a second consecutive term earlier this year. The four CARICOM countries that voted in favor of the resolution have supported the Lima Group that is seeking Maduro's removal and last month met with U.S. President Donald Trump on Venezuela. In other news, first-time music students got the opportunity to serenade a group at the Castries Comprehensive School with their musical talent. Music trainers from Venezuela for 10 months trained students who had never sang or used musical instruments before. Solange Alfred tells us more in this report. 58 students embarked on a 10-month collective practice of music training spearheaded by the St. Lucia School of Music in collaboration with music trainers from Venezuela. Executive Director of the School of Music, Richard Payne, heaped praises on the youth, while also informing those in attendance that this particular initiative was born from a similar project that yielded successful outcomes. This has not been the first attempt by the St. Lucia School of Music to launch a structured after-school music program for youth at risk. We have been in this arena, if you will, since 2010, starting with a really interesting partnership with the Organization of American States, the government of St. Lucia, and the school where we launched the program. You may or may not know of the Marsha Youth Orchestra program. And why is this significant? Because many of the people who are mentors, uh, which is another success story of this program, came from the Marsha Youth Orchestra. Meanwhile, District 1 Education Officer Cyrus Sipal highlighted the great achievement garnered by the participants. He stated the benefits of after-school programs like the system's youth orchestra and choir and noted that a continued effort will be geared towards the creation of programs that target at-risk youth. We understand that it was not easy, but you have conquered. You see, music is said to be a universal language. And we believe that music can be used as the medium to get every child to reach the pinnacle of their academic success. 
And this, ladies and gentlemen, the Ministry of Education, we look forward. What we are seeing here of these 58 students, if this program, we did not have it, where would they have been today? To what extent would they have reached the level they are right now in their um, music? So we understand now the significance and the importance of this program. And also, we would want to tell the School of Music and also the rest of, of the sponsors that the Ministry of Education is 100% behind this program. Minister with Responsibility for Culture and Creative Industries, Fortuna Belrose, delved into the theme of the presentation, Music Can Change the World. Belrose explored this theme and highlighted the impactful part that music plays in people's life. What is life without music? Boring, meaningless, no energy. Our students, yeah, without music, it's boring. It's meaningless, you know. Music is something that is extraordinary. It evokes passion, feelings. It causes us to reflect and think ahead. It places us in context, puts us in perspective. It shows off when we are happy and when we are sad. You know, it drives us and leads us to find our passion. You know, when we listen to the music, we listen to the words of the songs, it helps us find out really who we are and what moves us. To bring the curtain down on the presentation, the students showed off their angelic singing voices and impressive talent using musical instruments to bring a close to the 10-month chapter of their musical training. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I am Sula Jalford. This is the Hot 7 Nightly News. Sports News with Tennyson Glasgow is up next.